On May 25th, 2018, a new privacy law took effect in Europe, the GDPR or General Data Protection Regulation. It gives EU citizens control over who collects their personal data and over what happens with it. It's the reason why you are bombarded with these pop-ups asking your permission to gather and process your personal data, but also why email newsletters are asking you to confirm if you are still interested in them and why companies are suddenly making it more easy to grab a copy of the data that they have on you. Companies from all over the world are working quickly to make sure that they comply with the new regulations, because otherwise they will face hefty fines. But what about blockchain technology? If you've been following my channel, you probably came across the video in which I explain what a blockchain is and how it works. If you watched it, you know that the data on a blockchain is recorded in an open and transparent way. What's more, data stored on a blockchain cannot be changed or erased. These properties are what allow a blockchain to be completely distributed without a central authority. But at the same time, these properties don't sound too good with privacy in mind. So that got me thinking, does the GDPR kill blockchains? Well, let's first explore some terminology surrounding the GDPR. The EU calls companies that store your data, data controllers, and those that work with your data to analyze it, for instance, are called data processors. In most cases, the data controller is also the data processor, but they could also be different companies. It is the data controller that is responsible for complying with the GDPR. We also have to realize that the GDPR is only applicable if there is personal data of EU citizens involved. Any company storing any personal information of EU citizens should follow the regulations. Even foreign companies like Apple or Facebook should adhere to the law because they have European users. But hold on, what qualifies as personal data? Well, the law states that it means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And that is actually quite broad. Let me explain. Personal data sounds quite straightforward. You might think of your name, age and gender as personal data, and you would be correct. But what about your phone number or your credit card number or your computer's IP address? Are these personal information? These are just random numbers that we can't link directly to a person. But an internet service provider might, for instance, be able to link an IP address to an actual person. The same thing applies to your Bitcoin wallet address. It's just a string of random letters and numbers that cannot be linked directly to you. It can, however, be indirectly linked to you if you've bought some Bitcoin using your credit card or through an exchange. Even random letters and numbers can qualify as personal data if they can be linked to a person. So now that we know what the terms data processor, data controller and personal data mean, let's see how it conflicts with blockchain technology. There are three articles in the GDPR that are problematic. Let's start with article 16, which gives you the right to correct data that someone has on you. Not only can you change inaccurate data, you can also add new data if you feel that the current data is inaccurate or incomplete. Adding new data to a blockchain is not a problem, but changing data is. The same thing applies to Article 17, the right to be forgotten. Not being able to remove data from a blockchain means you can't exercise your right to delete your data, which means that blockchains can't comply with the GDPR and therefore they cannot store personal data of EU citizens. And finally, we have Article 18, which gives you the right to prevent companies from doing something with your data. You can do this when the data is inaccurate or if it was unlawfully collected. The problem here is that most blockchains are completely open, meaning anyone can grab a copy of the data and do anything they want with it. This also means that you have no control over who is processing your data. So how can a blockchain get around these issues? Well, let's take a look. The first solution would be to encrypt personal data before you store it on a blockchain. And this is where the law gets a bit hazy. Using strong encryption means that only the person or company with the decryption key can actually do something with your data. If you want to delete that data, all you have to do is destroy the key. And then in theory, the encrypted data becomes useless. At least that's how they view things in the UK. Others argue that strong encryption is still reversible. As our computers get faster over time, it's more likely that the encryption can be broken and reveal the personal data again. Maybe not such a good solution after all. A better solution would be to store the personal data in a permission blockchain instead of a public one. What's the difference? 
Well, a public blockchain is one where everyone can read the data that's stored inside of it and add new data to it. Permission blockchains are very different. Access is controlled and restricted to only a few known and trusted parties. By doing this, we can comply with Article 18 of the GDPR, the right to restrict who can process your data. But a permission blockchain is still immutable, meaning that we cannot edit or delete data and thus we can't comply with Article 16 and 17. Also not a real solution to our problem. A real solution would be to store the personal data somewhere else, somewhere where we have read and write access, let's say a secure server. Then we can store a reference to that data on our blockchain, almost like a shortcut or pointer. To create this link, we make a digital fingerprint of our data using a hash function, and then we store that hash on the blockchain. Why use a hash? Well, because it has two interesting properties. First of all, a hash function only works in one way, meaning you can create the hash of a piece of data, but you cannot take that hash and turn it back into that data. And secondly, a hash allows us to verify the integrity of the files on our central server, making sure that no one has tampered with it. The hash stored inside the blockchain is just a string of random letters and numbers, but it qualifies as personal data because it can be linked to the data on the server. If we now want to exercise our right to be forgotten, we just remove the actual data from the central server. In that case, the hash in our blockchain becomes useless and is no longer considered personal data because it points towards nothing. However, a solution like this isn't perfect because blockchains are completely decentralized and by moving to a system like this, you partially centralize it again. And finally, we have solution number four, zero knowledge proof. This technology allows you to prove that something is true without revealing the actual data. In case of a cryptocurrency, you can prove that a transaction happened without disclosing how much money you transferred or to whom. This technology is used by Zcash to let users completely hide their transactions. Let's imagine a simple example. Before entering a bar, you have to prove that you are over 21 years old. You can do that by showing your identity card, but then you reveal way more information about yourself than actually necessary. With zero knowledge proof, you can deliver the proof that you're over 21 years old without revealing your actual age or your date of birth. That way, people can only reveal the absolute minimum data about themselves. Interesting stuff. Leave a comment down below if you want me to make a video about zero knowledge proof in the future. So these are some solutions that would make a blockchain compatible with the GDPR. But let's assume that we don't care and we store personal data in a blockchain anyway. Well, then we have an interesting legal issue. The law states that the company who stores the personal information, the data controller, is responsible for obeying the law. But who is the data controller in a blockchain? Who should be held responsible? Is it everyone participating in the network? Is it the people who create and verify blocks? Or is it the people who write the protocols and who write the code? You can't blame everyone participating in the network because they have no control over what others store inside the blockchain. Well, then we can hold the people who make and verify blocks responsible, right? Well, not really, because they might not know that the data they have is actually personal. And that leaves us with the people who develop the blockchain protocols. We can't hold them responsible either because they're only developing a tool. Punishing them would be like closing hammer factories because their tools can be used to commit violent acts. So clearly we have some work to do. The GDPR is a great law to protect the privacy of EU citizens, but it leaves us with some questions as to how it can be applied to blockchains. We've seen a few ways in which a blockchain can be adapted to conform to the law, but some of these aren't really desirable. Others, like zero knowledge proof or the central server, do offer a solution. So that was it for this video. Leave a thumbs up and consider getting subscribed if you found this video interesting. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.